Wow, Shedsters. I don't know what it's like where you are, but here in London, it's hot. A bit like me, really, <laughs> according to the missus, I think. Anyway, moving on. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me today in the Holy Shed. And me, I've had a great day. I uh, preached this morning at St. Leonard's Church in Streatham on the most underrated virtue, I think, in Christendom, kindness, and why it's different to being nice. You can listen to it if you fancy. Uh, as soon as it's posted on the church website, I will put a link on Facebook. And by the way, I can't tell you how grateful I am to our dear friends, Anna, the rector, and Arthur, the rector's sexy husband, for welcoming us at St. Leonard's and for giving me the opportunity to yak on about stuff that is so important to me. Oh, um, while I'm saying thanks, I want to thank this little baby Robin. Bit of a latecomer, I guess, really, but um, it's a baby Robin. I want to thank this Robin for hanging out with me in the garden. Couldn't get rid of it, actually. It was like a little sidekick. Huh, maybe, you never know, maybe it's going to be an area bishop one day. <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, kick off today with a candle moment. So if you've got a candle handy, this will be a good time to get hold of it. And today's a free for all, you know, I just want you to light it for whoever or whatever the heck you want to, whoever is on your heart or you're concerned about today. I'm lighting mine for Anne's daughter. Anne's a regular shedster and her daughter is dealing with a horrible, uh, horrible cancer. And, um, and I just pray that she'll have doctors who know just what to do and who will help her find healing. And also after all that's happened this week since, you know, that blinking penalty shootout, I'm also lighting mine for people in all walks of life who experience racism. And I just pray that as a society, we will find a way to purge ourselves of this wretched scourge that causes so much hurt and so much damage, uh, so much discrimination. So grab your candle now and light it for whoever it is that you're thinking about. And let's just take a moment to focus on those people and send out some love from our hearts to them. God grant us the joy of knowing that we are loved beyond measure. God grant us wisdom to recognise those who crave love, even when they may not, that may not be obvious. And God grant us tireless resolve to treat other people the way we ourselves wish to be treated. Amen. Now, uh, as you know, through this summer period, we've been looking at the overall theme of how to read the Bible and still be a Christian. And I promised that this week we would be thinking a little bit about the book of Psalms. And uh, the interesting thing about the Psalms in the Bible is that on the one hand, they are the very epitome of establishment religion, you know, because a song or spoken psalm is certainly a staple part of regular Church of England liturgy and they're also the basis of, of daily prayers as well and yet anyone who has systematically read the Psalms rather than just picking out the two or three that, that they really like, anyone who reads them um, properly knows how very uncomfortable they can be, how subversive they can be actually. I mean some of them are shockingly frank expressing you know, things like real doubt. There's a lot of doubt in the Psalms. Uh, they include railing and anger toward God, uh, murderous threats of violence, including toward children, um, gloomy emotions of despair and wallowing lament. And, oh yeah, not to forget, they also provide the inspiration for a million irritating, happy, clappy praise songs. See, the thing about the Psalms is, they really make no attempt to be theologically correct. That is not the agenda of the psalmist. Um, 
They can be passionate, they can be brutal and basically ethically unsound. So you'd imagine that if there's any section of scripture that challenges our theme of how to read the Bible and still be a Christian, it would be the Psalms. But no, not in my book anyway. The Psalms actually help me to keep believing precisely because of the unchristian content in places. The book of Psalms is not only located smack bang in the centre of the Christian Bible. For me, the Psalms are the epicentre of real faith, of authentic faith, actually as a result of their raw emotion. That's what I think makes them authentic. Happy Clappy Christian worship almost tipped the balance for me, almost, you know, made me walk away from the church. Um, basically because of what I would see as a frequently trite culture of triumphalism and an awful lot of biblical literalism. I mean, I've seen people over the years who are suffering or going through all kinds of, of painful circumstances. I've seen them crushed by this culture of praisism, basically. You know, when they're told that uh, their circumstances, their anguish and so on uh, has to be set aside or overcome, you know, uh, by praise of God. And, um, you know, I mean, this is, to me, this is not only religious hogwash. It's actually potentially very dangerous religious hogwash because it can raise all kinds of mental health issues, um, emotional and psychological problems and so on. I mean, basically, for me, the Psalms are the belly centre of faith. The Bill of Rights for gut-level religion. Uh, Bono says that they're instinct over intellect. And uh, he's a great fan of the Psalms, by the way. Um, I think that it's in the Psalms that we are tutored in the sacred spiritual practice <laughs> of spilling our guts. But let's, uh, from the, on that note, lift the tone slightly with a little bit of neuroscience, eh? Brains, you know, brains are amazing things, which... By the way, I think we're supposed to use even in church. Um, brains are a, a, a bit like a vast computer, bigger than the cloud, probably. A functioning brain is a, is a complex set of neural networks which store and process all kinds of information. But here's the thing, you know, science is now confirming what mystics and religious contemplatives have known for centuries, which is that we don't just have one brain, we have three brains, three forms of intelligence, which are commonly labelled head, heart and gut. And yeah, it's true. We now know that we have a heart brain and a gut brain, as well as a brain in our heads. Um, take a little look at this. It's a video of someone called Becky Walsh, who, uh, well, I'll let you just watch it. I think it's a really interesting little video. I'm sure you've heard people say, I feel it in my stomach. I always go with my gut. But you might even say that yourself. But logically, we still like to believe that the best decisions are actually coming from the logical brain. But did you know that you have two other brains and one of them is in your gut? Embedded in the lining of the intestines is the eccentric nervous system with hundreds of millions of neurons, one thousandth the number of the ones in your brain. Gut neurons communicate with the brain through the vagus nerve, which runs from the base of the brain to the chest and abdomen. This gut reaction evolved to protect us from danger. Using the gut, we could sense predators before we even saw them with our own eyes. The clearest connection between the gut and the mind is how we express stress and anxiety. A gut instinct is when we have a reaction to something that we may find fearful. This information from your gut intuition will be sent to the brain for action. This reptilian part of the brain, which is in charge of keeping the body safe, reacts to hostile or frightening situations. It's normally a way of dealing with fear that can be well remembered using the five Fs. Flight, run away and get the heck out of there. Fight, stand still, and give it a bunch of five. Freeze, you know, how those animals and insects do, they keep playing dead because they're completely paralyzed with fear. Food, give the body energy to be able to cope with the situation. And 
fornicate. Uh, yes, there is probably another F I could use here, but uh, mm, we have a strong sexual desire for procreation of the species after stress. Think about the baby boom after a war or makeup sex after an argument. However the, brain decide, however, the brain decides the gut will send blood to the arms and legs in case we want to fight a predator or run like hell. Of course, now stressful situations are unlikely to be caused by a predator in this day and age, but our body's reaction is pretty much the same. Making decisions from this form of intuition means that we make choices out of fear or defence. There are, in fact, two forms of intuition, as I write about in my book, You Do Know, learning to act on intuition instantly. And the second form of intuitive knowing is often discounted because it has no words. It's rooted in emotion. For example, when we have an excited, expansive feeling, we just simply know. We may not understand what it is that we know, but we just know. And this second form of intuition comes from the heart. And the heart has its own independent nervous system. Like the gut, there are 30,000 nerve endings in the heart, as well as many various subcortical centres running towards the brain. Following this heart-led intuition can lead to remarkable life changes, as your decisions become about the expansion of who you are, rather than limiting yourself to pain or avoiding fearful situations. On a personal level of using heart-based intuition, it means that you can make quicker decisions about what is right for you, which also means a lot less stress. It means that you can open your heart more widely to people as you know who you can trust, making intuition from the heart the one to follow for love. So next time you hear, follow your heart, trust your gut, you'll understand that it's not quite the brainless act after all. Well, that's really interesting, isn't it? So let's just get this clear, uh, that we each ha have three brains, if you like. And um, as well as in the head, we've got systems of clustered neurons around the heart and also in the intestines. And uh, so it's reckoned that the head has, uh, is made up of about 100 billion neurons. The heart has around about 40,000 neurons uh, that form the heart brain. And the gut has 100 million neurons, not neutrons, by the way, as it says there. Um, so, th so the gut is now being referred to by many scientists as the gut brain. So here's the thing. Just imagine what Christian faith and or what prayer, for example, may look like or how it might be filtered through each of these different centres of intelligence. The dominant form of Christian faith, of course, and prayer in the Western world is based on rationality. It's very much a head-centred form of spirituality, which is fine. You know, the head's very important. But what about the rest? You know, that's the important thing. So, you know, I think that the uh, charismatic movement uh, was an important uh, initiative, really, because it shifted the emphasis much more toward the heart centre. And I think that's part of the great appeal of charismatic worship, because people who have been... Uh, born and bred and steeped in faith and religion that's very head-centred, um, found this very liberating, that suddenly their emotions come into play as well. And that, and that was great. Certainly it was very, very liberating to me, and I still hold on to that. The problem is that it still tended to remain in the grip of a very fundamentalist mindset. And, uh, and while uh, the charismatic tends to liberate positive, upbeat emotions in, in the whole praise culture. It also often suppresses negative emotions like doubt or sadness or melancholy. In fact, they're sometimes treated as things from which we need to be delivered. And what about the gut? You know, the gut is, is like the dark, messy brain that senses those, uh, you know, more uh, disturbing uh, instincts like anger and passion but these are part of who we are as well you know so what does a faith uh, look like what does prayer look like through the filter of the belly center I think that's partly what we find in the Psalms and the important thing is you know that authentic faith needs to include uh, 
a synergy of all three of these things rather than just majoring very much more in one of them. And, and I think it's this gutsiness of many of the Psalms that creates a struggle for nice, clean cut, respectable Christianity. At best, I think gut centered religion is embarrassing uh, for a neat and tidy faith. And at worst, it, it gets seen as being, you know, something demonic. So at the same time as saying that the whole Bible is the word of God, in practice, in practice, lots of Bible believing Christians basically kick the messy Psalms into touch. They're just basically ignored because, well, let's face it, how do you make sense? How do you make rational sense or theological, nice Christian sense of a Psalm like Psalm 137, where the writer is so angry that he talks about bashing the children of his enemies on the rocks. And you don't hear an awful lot of sermons about that, do you? But the important thing is to ask, what was it that was going on? What was the experience of this psalmist who, yes, you know, that Boney M made it into a nice little happy clappy song, didn't it, by the rivers of Babylon. But really, it's a very morose song or psalm, which culminates in this devastating instinct that wants to just get out there and, you know, be violent. So, uh, you know, Bono, you know, Bono is, is someone who, who seems to have a really great love. He's been very influenced by the Psalms. And, and he draws a comparison between the Psalms and kind of types of contemporary music. So he talks about the blues as being kind of backsliding music, really. It's the kind of dark brother of gospel music which is much more kind of upbeat. Um, so you find in church, blues music doesn't really feature very much, but everybody loves a cheery gospel song. Although I have to say that if you really look at what some of the gospel songs are saying beneath that sort of, you know, bouncy, cheery sort of musical exterior, there are often quite dark things going on underneath the surface. So, you know, the fact is neat and tidy Christians really like all the praise the Lord isn't God good kind of psalms, <laughs> but not so much the where the hell are you God psalms, of which there are quite a lot. And the real problem is, you know, you don't want to praise the Lord, do you? When you or one of your loved ones has got a, a potentially death sentence diagnosis, or when you lose your job, or, or when your marriage breaks up, or when you've lost a baby, you know, or when someone's getting away with stuff that you feel like is so wrong that you want to go out and kill them, right? I mean, I do have those emotions sometimes when I'm watching the news. So I'd like you just to take a little look at another clip now, which is uh, a clip by my favourite Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, where he's talking here a little bit about the Psalms of Vengeance. Take a look. The fifth element that, I, that hasn't come up in these Psalms, but I do want to comment on it, um, and, and that is the vengeance. Uh, one, of the, one of the objections to these Psalms is that they really want God to get the guys that have done it. So uh, the, the best case for that I know is in Psalm 58. Psalm 58, 6. And you can imagine saying this, and then your psychotherapist says, is there anything else you'd like to say? Yes! And he goes again. 58, 6. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouth. And you could just, in a nice congregation, you can see doing this and you say, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. <laughs> O God, break the teeth in their mouth, tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord, let them vanish like water that runs away like grass that's trodden down, let them be like the snail that dissolves into the slime, into the untimely birth that never sees the sun, sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or blaze, may he be swept away. Ah. Now the word is that Christians ought not to use these psalms because Christians ought not to feel that way. Agreed. But why do you feel that way? 
We do have, from time to time, yearnings for vengeance. So the question is, not should we feel that way, the question is, if you feel that way, what are you going to do with it? And I can think of only three things you can do with your thirst for vengeance. You can act it out, get a gun, we're seeing that, but people like us wouldn't do that. You can deny it, hmm. but what happens when you deny it, it tends to come out somewhere else that you didn't plan on, in your family or somewhere else. The third thing you can do, which is what Freud understood so well, you can give it over to your therapist, you can give it over to God. And I propose that's what they're doing in these psalms. They're saying, I am being eaten alive by my anger, and I'd like to hand it off to you. Well, parents tend to know about this. Two siblings are playing in the backyard and one of them hurts the other one and the problem is that the parent doesn't really know who initiated it. But the one who has a little scratch with a little blood comes in the house and like a psalmist must use great hyperbole to get mother's attention that if you don't do something quickly, I'm going to die from this blood. You do get exaggerated speech. And you do a band-aid, and you think you've gotten it taken care of, but then he says, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do about him? I'll not be happy till you punish him for what he did to me. A wise parent does not say, you can't talk that way about your brother. A wise parent does not say, wait a minute, let me write this down so that I can do it. A wise parent says, uh, why don't you leave that to me? I have heard you, and now you can leave it with me, and I'll decide what needs to be done. I think that's uh, how these psalms, at their best, work. And the recovery of the thirst for vengeance in the Psalter, it seems to me to be an important project in the life of the church. Otherwise, people, and particularly young people, don't know that we know about that stuff. And we have known about that stuff forever. And we have devised ways of processing it to health. Whoa, that Psalm 58's a real winner, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, imagine trying to fit that into a nice, cheery Christian service. But you know, maybe we should. Maybe we should. Maybe that's, you know, part of the problem because prayer sometimes needs to be an act of spilling our guts to God or to the universe or to the trees in a forest or however or wherever you find God or imagine yourself talking to God. But that's not to say that uh, it's going to be easy to do that when we've been trained to swallow these feelings or or even demonize or deny them can we allow ourselves to feel angry with god without theologically rationalizing and, and toning it down but as walter brueggemann says it's not a case of should i feel this way but what will i do with these feelings when i do have them and you know well the psalmist says spill them out to God that's that's what the Psalms are telling us prayer can't be real or true if it's always polite it just can't be that way you know we're not talking to the Queen here <laughs> filtered through theological correctness um, you know we, it just can't be that really as Brueggemann says that's a form of denial and the emotions or gut reactions will find another way out 
uh, that may be a lot less healthy. Did the psalmist expect God to jump to, to intervene and make things right when he cried out in this way? It may seem that way, but I'm not so sure. Certainly, I don't believe in prayer as a way to persuade God or, you know, force God, put God's arm up his back, as it were, or her back, <laughs> to make God intervene. Even if my prayer sometimes does sound like I'm banging on the table for a response. It's pretty obvious, I think, that prayer doesn't work in that straightforward instrumental fashion. But still, it's true that we need to bang on the table sometimes. And maybe that's a lot more for us than it is for God. Rabbi Harold Kushner, who I've quoted a few times now, famously wrote a book called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it's based on his experience of losing a son to a horrible degenerative disease. And he argues that God's, promised, uh, God's promise was never that life would be fair. God never promised that life would be fair. God's promise, he says, was that when we have to confront the unfairness of life, we would not have to do it alone, for God would be with us. And that's very much what Psalm 23 is really about, isn't it? But in the process of that, we would often need to vent our true feelings to God. The mind is a place of rationality, of course, where we clean things up, where we organise our thoughts, where we get things straight, we get the story straight. The heart is a very up and down place where we may experience ecstasy at one moment or despair the next. It's the part of us that... Uh, can empathize and reach out to and connect with other people but the gut the gut is like you know a dirty messy primal place it's the dark cellar of our being where nothing is sanitized or straightforward it's disorderly and rebellious and worrying it's where too uh, a price is paid when we're dishonest uh, and when we suppress uh, rather than express what we really feel, it's, it's, it's your gut that takes count. There's nothing like a pain in the gut, is there? So why do I sometimes spill my guts to God? Why do I pray angry, desperate, complaining, rebellious prayers? Well, because basically something deep inside of me needs to do that. It makes me more human. It may also help me perhaps to deal with life's hardship in a healthier way and even perhaps find the strength and courage, the passion to go out and change things that I am able to change. I remember a long time ago now uh, reading a quote somewhere and I've never been able to find it since where John Wesley said something like this anyway, we would be much better venting our anger into the bosom of God. And I believe that. I believe that's prayer as well, by the way. So we're going to say a prayer now and uh, is one I wrote earlier. Warm, moist, salty God, you have shown us that grace is always embodied, materialised, in cream cakes and green vegetables, in red wine and freshly baked bread, in damp grass and mighty oaks, colourful birds and grey mornings, in the beauty of flawed humanity. Help us, we pray, to embrace the wonder of who we are, to never deny what we feel or love or long for, but embrace unswervingly the grace of this carnal adventure we call life. May our days, pleasant or sad, fulfilled or frustrated, be crowned with the assurance that nothing in life is worthless or without significance, but charged with mundane grandeur. Amen. Okay, well, you know, we've come to that point now to the Holy Shed Sacrament, uh, where I invite you to, to pour a glass of something, whatever it be. Uh, charge your glasses or your mugs or whatever it is, your beakers, and join me in a toast. I invite you to make a toast, a toast to gut instincts. To honesty and reality, a toast to life, uh, you know, to courage instead of fear, to love and reconciliation instead of enmity, a toast to 
struggling with hard questions, um, even when there's no obvious answers to them. A toast to life with all its puzzles, pleasures and possibilities. Added to which, I would like to toast the three hijabis. I hope you know the three hijabis. If not, Google them. Three amazing Muslim women who love football and hate uh, racism. So to all these things, dear friends, I propose a toast to life. Lachaim. Well, we're nearly there. Thank you for joining me again in the Holy Shed. And uh, if you like what I'm doing and you want to support us, you can do that through uh, this coffee website. The link is always at the top of the Holy Shed page, at the top of the posts on the Holy Shed page. And we thank you uh, so much from the bottom of our hearts, all those of you who support us uh, in this way. And uh, I'm going to give you an icon today, an icon of the day. I love this icon, don't you? Today, by the way, the psalm for today in the lectionary actually is Psalm 23. And that's why I thought of this icon, which is another one by Kelly Latchmore. And, uh, well, it's a woman. Shepherdess, shepherd, whatever. What a beautiful face there. I find the kindness and love of God in this beautiful icon. You might like to take a picture of it and or you can find it on the internet and just spend a little time contemplating this. I think you will be a lot better off for doing that. Okay, well, uh, we're just about there now. Um, some of you may have noticed that I wrote an article, an opinion uh, column for Christianity magazine. Uh, I was asked if I would write a few words on uh, Boris Johnson saying that he's a very, very bad Christian, but Christianity is a wonderful thing. So uh, if you haven't read that, you'll find it there. And uh, yeah, here we are. In a moment, I'm going to leave you with a video. It's a music video called A Lament for Syria. So psalms are often psalms of lament. And this is a lament, a poem by a beautiful young Syrian woman called Amina Abu Karec. And uh, so I hope you enjoy that. Meanwhile, have a good week. Be kind to yourselves. Be kind to people around you. Hey, stay human. <laughs> Go well, and uh, I'll see you very soon. Bye. Syrian doves croon above my head. They cool cries in my eyes. I'm trying to design a country that will go with my poetry and not get in the way when I'm taking. Where soldiers don't walk over my face, I'm trying to design a country which would be worthy of me if I made for a boat and make allowances if I burst into tears. I'm trying to design a city of love, peace, concord and virtue, free of mess, war, wreckage and misery. Oh Syria, my love, I hear you moaning in the cries of the dogs. I hear you screaming cry. I left your land a merciful soil and your fragrance of jasmine. My wing is broken like your wing. I'm from Syria, from a land where people become a discarded piece of bread so that does not get trampled on. From a place where a mother teach her son not to step on ants at the end of the day. From place where a teenager hides his cigarette from his old brother out of respect. From place where old ladies would water jasmine trees at dawn. From the neighbors, coffee in the morning. From after you, aunt, as you wish, uncle, with a pleasure, sister. From place which endured, which waited, which is still waiting for relief. 
I will not write poetry for anyone else. Can anyone teach me how to make a homeland? Heartfelt, thanks. Heartiest, thanks. From the house of sparrows, the upper trees of Syria, and you're very sincerely.